Oh yes. You are our God. Yes, my King. In all circumstances, Amen. you are our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' Thank name. You, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Hallelujah. We are studying the seven churches in the book of Revelation, so you just turn to Revelation chapter three. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter three. We are studying the seven churches. We saw the church of uh, Ephesus. We saw the church of. Uh, Siena, we saw the church of uh, Pegamos, we saw the church of Titira, the church of Sardis, and today this is the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia. That's what we are studying. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 from verse 7. We are going to read down to 13. Hallelujah. And we see that uh, it's the instruction of the Lord for, for us. To study these churches because God said we should prepare the church for his coming. Who is making noise now? Making noise. We should prepare his church for his coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's why we are studying all this to prepare ourselves for his coming. And we saw that the messages for this church are showing the different period of the church in this world, the church of God. We'll come to summarize that maybe the last, this is second to the last church. When we treat the church, last church, then we'll summarize that. We also see that the messages are for individual churches. The messages are for you and me as individuals. Hallelujah. These messages, they go through the ages and they are for everybody to prepare us for the second coming of the Christ, the Lord. Because the aim, the goal of Christianity is the soul, is the, is the salvation of our souls. Hallelujah. The goal of being a Christian, the reason why you even go to church. Maybe some people just go to church, like for social gathering. The reason is that you will spend eternity with God. That's the reason. If that's not the reason, why will you not just sleep under your blanket? Like other people, watch your films and enjoy. Go play a soccer on Sunday. Why are you here? You want to make heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. If that's not your goal, begin to make that your goal. Hallelujah. Amen. I will read from Revelation. Uh, Sister Ruta, you can read from verse 7 to 13. Hallelujah. Amen. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, Though they are not, but, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who love on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take, will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hallelujah. Amen. To all the churches, God is saying like that. Amen. He who has an ear should hear. I want to say, Bram of Gilead, you are so blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. God keep talking to you, talking to me. He who has an ear, ear. So we, we see a little bit, just a little bit of the background of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the churches in Asia Minor that existed in the time of John. When John was even a, a thrown in the island of Patmos, where he write Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. And Philadelphia was one of those churches. And the, the reason why this uh, area, this community that became a, a, a city was founded was so that they should uh, promote the Greek culture. They wanted to promote Greek culture. So this community was formed for that purpose. And it was a beautiful city, and it was prosperous, and it has a highway. It connected different, different continents. Philadelphia. 
you can live from here to another continent, from here to another continent, to another, from here to from Philadelphia to different different continents of the world. Hallelujah. And we will see that this is important for the gospel. Yeah. Uh, so they also, you know, all the churches in all the places they wanted them to worship false gods. They wanted to, them to worship other gods, and the churches went persecution. Hallelujah. So Jesus comes to the church of uh, Philadelphia and he introduces himself to that church. He says that these are the word of him who is holy and true. Jesus introduces himself to the church of Philadelphia. We saw that every each of the church. Jesus will introduce himself according to the message that he gives to that church. He doesn't just introduce himself. He told this church that he is the one who is holy and true. And who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shut, no one can open. That's how he introduces himself. And holiness here indicates the, the day, indicates who, who Jesus is. He is Yahweh himself. Who is holy again? But God. Jesus is holy. You know in the book of John 10, 30, Jesus has claimed, I and my father are one. So he was uh, again reiterating, uh, re repeating the point to this church. Letting them, emphasizing the fact that he is God, he is holy, he is true. True means, true means that he is not fake. Hallelujah. We know there are fake Christs that have come. Christ. This, many people have claimed that they are Jesus, they are Christ. On earth here. One died 2020 something. When I was 20, Papa, can you remember where in Bella? The man who claimed in Korea, Song Yong Po, he claimed he was Christ. And he also died. But Jesus is saying here that he is the truth. Hallelujah. And they worship that man like Christ. They worship, and his followers are still worshiping him today. Like Jesus. Yeah. Song Yong Mo. If you ask about the moments, you can hear about them. I'm sure they are in Cape Town. So, they believe that they are Christ. But Jesus is emphasizing to John here. He is the truth. And if you have come to know that truth, hold to that truth. Hallelujah. He is holy. He is he is introduces himself as holy. That means he is he cannot be classified. Jesus is in the class where the Father is. He and the Father are one. You cannot classify Jesus. You cannot say Jesus is like human being. Jesus. Some people say God is like uh, uh, they call him pantheism. Is like part of the earth. No, Jesus is not part of the earth. Jesus is the Creator. Jesus is God Himself. Is God incarnate. Hallelujah. So that's how you introduce him. That is, you know who he is. Jesus is talking to you. You know who he is. You are not just believing in a fake God. You are believing in somebody important. And he say he opens, when he opens a door, no one can shut. He's talking about his authority. He holds the key of David. You know that all the kings in the Bible, the prophecy, the, when you look at the prophecies in the Bible, they were talking about Jesus, prophesying about a king who will be born. If you read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it said, Unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his soldier. He will be called mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Was talking about Jesus, prophesying that that king will be perfect. If you look at the prophecy, and Jesus came to fulfill it, he holds the key of David. That means he's that perfect king. He has the authority to admit you into the kingdom. He has the authority to say you are not qualified for the kingdom. That's what he's saying here. Hallelujah. Jesus is the only one. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus qualifies you for eternity, nobody can say you are not qualified. And when he rejects you for eternity, you are rejected. So you have to understand who he is, his authority. This is the only way, the truth and the life. Nobody goes to the Father except through Jesus. No other religion can take a person to heaven. No other way, it is only through Jesus. It is not even through joining the church that you can enter heaven. Hallelujah. It is through believing in the name of Jesus. It is through giving your life to Jesus. It is through have a relationship with Jesus. He holds a key. Hallelujah. He holds a key. And when he opens, no one can shut. And when he shut the door, no one can open. We have been singing here. The choir has been singing here. And, and we believe that Jesus is that one who can open and no one can close. He can shut and no one can open. Hallelujah. Amen. He knows something about the church. Verse 8. Look at that. Revelation 3 verse 8. 
he says that, I know you are this. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You will realize that it is only the church of Philadelphia and the church of Semenya that were not, Jesus did not say he has anything against them. Yeah, there was nothing against these two churches. To the church of Semenya, he said, stand firm even to the point of death. For, he, for here we will see that he will say, hold on to what you already have. The church of Philadelphia, we want to see, when we are going down, we get to look and see what was so special about this church that Jesus did not have anything against him. What was so special? You will not even see that way. I was starting to bad things happening in the church. But there are things, there are reasons why Jesus saw this church as complete. Hallelujah. So, uh, he says that he knows their deep. The church of this Philadelphia has also been like the other churches that were persecuted. It was persecuted, but they persevered and went through. So Jesus saw their deed. Jesus also is seeing the deed of individual believers here. If you have been persecuted for the sake of Christ, he knows, he knows, and he said he see it. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have been standing firm, Jesus is seeing you as an individual. He knows everything. There are books in heaven. He is writing every detail about us. I was shocked one day. God showed me a revelation in a dream. Uh, I, still about this, my calling, I think I told him yesterday, when God called me, there were some things I had to, to put right or to accept fully the calling. One day I dreamt, because God told me that I would, I love to be a nurse. I love to work in the hospital. That's, and I even worked there for some time before I went back for study. So when God called me, he showed me that you will go and be a nurse in the field. Every time you show me I'm doing nursing, but in the field. In the field where they work farm, in the field out of the hospital. Then every time I asking God, what kind of work do you want me to work for you? Out, he said, you will be a nurse in the hospital, in the field. That means you will not be the nurse, practical nurse on earth. So one day, I was still like, not understanding. I had that revelation. I saw one of the angels came in the form of a nurse. There were a lot, lot of casualties, casualties in that hospital. Then I was standing at this junction. And then another lady came and told me that myself, I'm looking for my own job. I've known her. I said, I've had my own, but I'm coming late to the job. I knew God called me, but I was delayed. So I was coming late. I'm, I'm late now. So I'm standing here now. They are angry with me. The angel came to me and said, come here, come here. Angry with me and said, take this patient. I was pushing the patient. He said, today, what you have done will go into the record. And I knew. You have delayed. You are late for this assignment. It will go into the record. They will write it. You know that God is keeping details about you. Hallelujah. So God is keeping details. So he knows everyone's deed. He knows your deed. You are not any color deed. He doesn't know whether you washed your clothes yesterday or you cooked uh, rice and stew yesterday. He knows your deed as far as this kingdom of God is concerned. Hallelujah. He is keeping record. Some of us will be so shocked on the last day when God will open our record and we'll see our friends. I've often told you that one of the greatest things about teachers that I learned as a student is that some teachers, when you fail exam and you are arguing, well, I wrote you because to you, you think you really wrote well. But you see your marks, you are not happy. The teacher will just call one student and say, okay, bring your own paper. And you say, take this student paper, sit down and read, and see what the student wrote, and compare with your own. I did that one time, I told myself, no, this student deserves the marks. That's how God is doing. When you open the book, you see another believer, you say, no, he deserves it. It may be not in this church, in another church or somewhere in the world. You will say he deserves it because he went through trial. He took it. The, he took the bull by the horn. He stood the test. He stood the test of time. He went through all thin and thick. He persevered. He did not compromise his faith. Last week we heard that the church of uh, yeah, the church of Sardis compromised their faith. They were living like unbelievers. They just live the way the unbelievers were living. They get right, they get. They stole, they stole. They smoke, they smoke. They dress naked, they dress naked. Everything. They were just living like unbelievers. God said you have a repetition of being alive, but you are dead. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. So, 
God knows. He says to that church, I have opened a door before you. Do you know the door that God has opened? The door, as we saw that Philadelphia was like a, a road junction to the different continents. The door that God said he is open. I know that most of us when we look at this place, we say, hey, God has opened a door before now. I will be rich. That's not what God is saying here. We declare this year in this church a year of what? Discipleship and wonderful. This open door that God is talking is about discipleship. He has opened a door before the Philadelphia church that nobody can close. There was at the center, the junction of where people live to different continents of the world. That door was for them to preach the gospel because when you preach the gospel in Philadelphia, people will hear in Africa, people will hear in America, people will hear in Asia, in all the continents. Hallelujah. Amen. So they were at a strategic place to carry the gospel. So he's talking about, if you read, somebody should just read 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 8 to 9, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 12 to 13. That's another person. Some person opened 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 to 9. Who is there? Another one, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Somebody, uh, sister, read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 to 9. Read it. Yeah. Chapter 16, 8 to 9. 8 to 9, yeah. I read. But I will say on the I will say but I will stay on at Ephesians until Pentecost. Huh? Because a great door yeah, yeah. for effective work has opened for me. Yeah. It's opened to me. Yes. And there are many who oppose me. Yeah. It was Paul saying you will stay. Because a what a great door for what? Read it again. Hallelujah. A great door for effective work has opened for me. Then that's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 to 13. I thought I had to uh, the year, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, yeah. I still had no peace of mind yeah. because I did not find my brother Titus there. Yeah. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Yeah. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, triumphal procession in Christ and, and through us spread everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Okay. Yeah, he's talking about the gospel. We see, when Paul is talking about open doors, he's talking about the gospel. The opportunity, the, 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 the privilege to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Even in some places where they don't want to hear Jesus, believers are killed, believers are persecuted, but when they see a little open door, they still preach the gospel. Because Paul keeps saying that because a door has been opened for me. And in Colossians 4, 3 to 4, the Colossians chapter 4, 3 to 4, he said that the believers in Colossians should pray for him, that God will be, doors will be opened for the message. Hallelujah. Amen. So, if we say that our goal is discipleship, I want to ask you, how much are you doing the discipleship? How much are you preaching the gospel? Why I'm saying like this? Because South Africa is one of the places with a great open door for the gospel. When we were in Bible school, the, the lecturers always told us, often times, South Africa is a, 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 is a rainbow nation. It's a place where many, many people come from different, different countries to stay here. If you can successfully really preach the gospel in South Africa, you have preached to many different from, people from different, different countries. You have reached different countries. You see, you want to preach the Americans are here, the Zimbabweans are here, the Congolese, the Cameroonians, the, the Tanzanians, the, the Bangladesh. Bangladesh, or the Chinese. The Indians. You have the Indians. You will preach the gospel here. A door has been opened, Bam of Healing. A door has been opened. One man of God calls Purchase. Somebody came to him and said, I want to know how to preach this gospel. How can I do to evangelize? When he said like that, the man of God told him that, what are you doing in life like uh, to earn a living? The man said, I'm, I'm an engine driver in the train. Then this person asked, asked him, is the person who is putting coal, you know in the trains in the early days they were using coal. I don't know whether they still use coal today to burn. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The, 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 the spurgeon had asked him, is the man that is putting coal to burn the, 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 the fire for the engine, is that man born again? 
Does the man know you are a Christian? Say, I don't know. He say, go and start from there. Go and start from there. You have neighbors. You have business part. You have people come to your business. Some of them are even people that you know that they are, this is my customer. Do they know you are a child of God? Have you preached the gospel? Those are open doors, Bob of Gilead. Ooh, how many times will we just... Are we serious? We know that Jesus is coming soon. And he's coming with reward to give to us according to what we have done. What does Jesus need from us? He wants us to preach the gospel. That's what he wants. He wants us to, to evangelize that many souls will come to the kingdom. We want us to be a missionary church. Hallelujah. If you just receive Christ and even your passenger in the car, don't know that you are a born again. You, there are opportunities. Sometimes they say things that will cause you to start preaching. People are conversing. They say things that will just open a door for you to preach. You are moving. You just have tracks. You give. I wonder how many of last week how many of us preached or even told one person about this Jesus. You saw a lot of people. Lord, even to just say Jesus loves you. Let me tell you, brethren. Let me tell you. Talk about Jesus. When you start telling people about Jesus, they will start looking at your own life too. Whether you are living that gospel. Many times people don't talk about Jesus because they, are sick. they, they don't live the life. You don't live the life that please Christ. That's why you don't preach. And secondly, you don't even, you are just like, eh, 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 eh. I don't know what to say. You don't know your priority as a child of God. Because if you know, that would be a hard beat to preach the gospel. You, you just pass, people are dying and going to hell, your neighbor died, your brother, some of them, even your family members, they are dying. Wait, don't listen, my brother died. You, the first thing I always ask, did he know the Lord? Did he know the Lord? If he didn't know the Lord, I'll cry the more. If he knew the Lord, I said, we thank God, you will meet him in heaven. Hallelujah. But some of us don't care. It means that you're not even born again. If you're born again, you know what heaven means? Hell means you preach to your relative. That they will die, you cry, but other things, you don't even cry whether they are going to heaven or to hell. Children of God, are we serious? Then you first have to be born again again. You have to give your life again to Jesus. To know the importance of preaching the gospel. So I want to challenge us. There are open doors before us. Jesus was talking to Philadelphia, I have opened a door. Do you know that there's an open door? We have an open door in Zwezwe there. Babo Gideon has an open door in Zwezwe. We have asked people even to up, to go preach there. It's an open door. Even the evangelism team, I've not seen any person say, I want to go preach there. Open doors. So people have not even set their foot on that place, even to help be in the tent that will bear. What, what, how do you want to serve God? Hallelujah. So if you are a student, your classmates must know. If you are a teacher, let your student know. Let your colleagues, teachers know. If you are a businesswoman, let, let your, 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 your your customers know. If you are a, a teenager like this one, let your friend teacher you know. Did you ever tell them Jesus loves you? Tell them. Some of them want to go suicide. Some of them are frustrated. Tell them Jesus loves you. Come, come to church. Hear that Jesus loves you. Amen. And when you don't 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 say that you don't know how to preach. Just tell people Jesus loves you. Just tell them that God can help you. Hallelujah. You are preaching the gospel. Just tell them you are on testimony if you are born again. If you are not born again, you will not have a testimony to tell people. But if you are born again, tell them that Jesus has changed my life. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what has killed the church of today? The church, uh, the church of God, the church of Christ. It is, give me, give me money. Give me cars. Give me an open. That's what has killed the church. Our priorities, our self, self, self. We don't think about the kingdom. Today, God wants us to start thinking about the kingdom. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. God wants us to start thinking about the kingdom. Amen. Start preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, I know. I know. I have I, opened a door. And Jesus said, that door that he has opened for us to preach, nobody can close. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> so this city was a misnamed city. It was a city that would spread the gospel through the Greek culture. You know the Greek culture, the Greek culture, a culture is a life and the style and the characteristic of people in a different community. So they had their culture. Tap your brother and say, brother, are you hearing? Tap everybody. I know why. Say, tap everybody. Say, brother, are you hearing? Okay. If you are hearing, lift your own hand up and say, I'm hearing. I'm hearing. Because I want to see this. So this church, this Greek
Greek culture was to be publicized. And it was an opportunity because they were, you know that the, the New Testament was written in Greek and a few other places in Aramaic. So, in order to translate, to, to, to preach the Greek culture, they were indirectly preaching the gospel. The believers took the he opened, God opened the door that they should preach the gospel. As they are translating in, into, they translated the Bible in Greek, they preached the gospel. Hallelujah. That was an open door. So that when people are learning about the Greek culture, the believers will also talk about the culture of God. Because the people of God have their characteristics. They have their lifestyle. So while you are talking about the Greek culture, you are also talking about the culture of God. And the culture of God is above all other culture. Jesus said no one could shut that door. Hallelujah. No one has authority. Hallelujah. Bam of Gilead, as well as any other church, God has opened the door before us. Amen. You still, the door is open. Nobody, if you are preaching in this market, will somebody come and beat you? Oh. Even if they beat you. The doors are open. They have not yet said, don't preach again. We are not seeing that. Even in the train, people will preach. Everywhere you can preach. Nobody will stop you. Please, brethren, I want to plead. Let's preach. Hallelujah. And Jesus say, say, I know. I know that I, I know that you have little strength. Are you seeing that place? Verse yes. 8. Verse 8 of that uh, Revelation chapter 3. From verse 8. Yeah, he said, I know you have little strength. Ah, you begin to think that, oh, that church was very weak. Was that church very weak, brethren? No. I know you are did see a place, an open door, an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. What is Jesus saying here? I know you have little strength. Somebody should, uh, I'll just quote this one. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. The Bible said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, you like a reading. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. That's one of, you know the Beatitudes is a beautiful, one of the greatest, uh, I don't know what to say. The sermons that Jesus preached. Let me say sermons that Jesus preached. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Somebody should read here. 85 verse 3. Yeah. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to begin to know why Jesus was saying that. Uh, uh, Jesus has found this church complete in such a way that he has nothing against it. Like the other six that we have studied. The, the other five. This one is number six. Yes. The last one will be loudest here. Jesus didn't find anything against it. But he said, you, you, I know that you have little strength. And this place said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How can you be poor in spirit? And you are, you are, you have the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever thought about it? I like some people in this church. They don't give me rest when they read the Bible. They will call me, Mama, Mama. Why does this place me? And when people start to tickle me like that, I know they are children of God. You don't just read the Bible and leave it. It means that blessed are the poor in spirit. Ah, it means you see yourself that you have not arrived in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. You see that you have not arrived. No child of God, no man of God, no bishop, no apostle, no super apostle, or archbishop, or they, 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 they give, they give, no prophet. They give some right reverend, right reverend, right reverend. No one will ever arrive. If the right reverend or bishop or apostle arrive in, in, with things of God has already reached the mark, that one will start either going to apostasy, start compromising, start backsliding. Poor in spirit means you are always thirsty for the things of God. You are always thirsty to pray. You are always thirsty to study the word. You are always thirsty to evangelize. You are always thirsty to, to fellowship. These four things, if you have not been, if you are not thirsty again for any of these things, you are dragging down. You must have that desire. If you go somewhere and don't have a church to fellowship, you must be feeling, oh my God, I need fellowship. You must be say, oh, I didn't pray yesterday. No, you something must be tickling. I didn't pray. I have to study the word. You cannot know the word enough, and the word is food for our souls. So the church that in poor in spirit keep hungry, getting hungry. You don't see the benches empty. People are dead. The church that in poor in spirit take their responsibility to serve God. The church that is poor in spirit are always let me reach. That's why I said the doctrine of one self 
itself or is demonic. Let's hear what Paul says. Let's hear. It's demonic. It's not good. It's not of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know what is First uh, Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Let me see what is first or second Corinthians. Let's see. First Corinthians. Paul was. Oh, let's read First Corinthians chapter 9. First. Let's read First Corinthians chapter 9. Where Paul is talking about how you run a race. First Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, Uh, verse 20, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running endlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the almighty Paul, the almighty apostle, let me call him. He says that he run this Christian race in such a way that even though he has preached, he will not be disqualified. Then you say, what says say for all? This is the Bible saying it. Hallelujah. Amen. So those who are poor in spirit always see that they need Christ the more. And that's a growing church. And those are people that will stand firm. When you have arrived in such a way that you don't even have interest in the Bible again. I know this Bible in my head. I know. Don't always say you know. When people always say, I know, I know, I know. Even God is revealing things to you. You have not known nothing. I'm telling you. If you leave these three things, you must always do it. Don't always think you have known, brethren. You don't know. The Bible says he who thinks he starts to take heed, let him, his, him fall. Let him fall. Hallelujah. So the church of Philadelphia were constant in the things of God. They were poor. They keep searching their spirit. And God said, they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Are you poor in spirit? Do you, are you hungry to read the word? Are you hungry to preach the word uh, to others, to do evangelism? Are you, are you thirsty to fellowship? To, some people will absent church for, 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 for two months. You are not serious. No matter what excuse you give, you are not serious. Two months. Everything being a poor minus corona. <laughs> minus corona. <laughs> because corona we were locked down. But the time will come when they say we should not fellowship because what? We'll be fellowshipping differently. The time is coming. Prepare. If you don't stand now, you don't stand. That time. Hallelujah. Amen. When you miss this church for four weeks, you have met three, three meetings times four. What is that? 24. 12, 24, eh? 3 times 4 is what? 12. 12. Times 2, 24. Times, yeah. For, for 2 months, it's 24 meetings that you have missed. And then you just relax you. You are not serious, brethren. You are not serious. I'm telling you, you are not serious. If you are hungry, if you are poor in spirit, you will not stay. Do you know that I beat some women back home in my country? Lock them at home. They go to that church. I had a friend. The friend will come. And she was very highly educated. She will come behind the door. And I will just open the back door church and you enter because they didn't. She will enter because they didn't want her to fellowship. She got married, they got born again. The husband was not born again. The husband will beat her. Blood is coming. They will come and call me. Come and take her. I say it's your wife. I'm not taking. They will beat her. Blood is coming like this. That she should not go to that church, but she was hungry. She was hungry for the gospel. She would cry to me and say, Auntie Winnie, I just want to pay my tithe. I want to know the joy of paying the tithe. We are putting this money together. I say, pay your tithe even from your pocket allowance. God will still see it. She was a highly educated and well placed woman walking. And she was hungry. I don't know. We are not hungry for Christ again. I don't see people hungry for Christ. And do you know what happened? She paid the price and as a result, the husband is born again. The younger brother in law, the husband is born again now. The younger brother in law, who used to be, 
he will mock at me, mock at Papa. Sometimes I'll feel, I'll feel like, to, hey, that boy, he's a pastor now. Ah, he's a pastor. He knows him. I was shocked. I'm telling you, preach this gospel, you'll be shocked. Because the person, some people say, hey, that one can that one believe? Who tell you? You are meaning that you save your soul. You know that you were not even qualified to believe. God save you. How can you say that one cannot believe? How can you say that one cannot believe? Any person can believe. Preach the gospel. I'm telling you, there's a person who has shocked me in life. I said, this boy has believed, not only believe, become a pastor. Ah, he will mock the gospel. Ah, and he's coming from a background that is so paganic that you don't even believe. But he's a pastor now. Hallelujah. Amen. Preach the gospel and stand firm. God has opened a door before you. Hallelujah. No one could shut. And be thirsty. When you are thirsty, you are doing these four things. Hallelujah. That I've named over and over. You have little strength. You have kept my word. That's what it says in that Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 verse. Let's see verse 8. He said, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you know what it means to deny the name of Christ? Jesus says, if you will deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father who is in heaven. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Jesus said like that. If you know that, why the, the kings of Christians all over the world, they will catch you tight and say, stand here. Do you still accept Jesus? They say they accept, then they shoot them. Do you know why it happens like that? Do you know why they cannot say, no, then go and repent? I think we should read that place. We have been reading that place. Read Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, somebody. We have been reading it over and over, but I want to prepare your mind. I think God is preparing our mind for something. You can't stand before men and renounce Jesus. You can't stand before men and say, I don't believe Jesus because that's condemnation to hell. That's why you see those brethren in other countries, they will shoot them. You have been seeing those things, they have been showing those images or images on the social media. Do you see them? They will shoot and shoot, they shot one brother, hey, I saw the testimony, I was broken. And the brother got up and said, I forgive them. The brother said, I forgive all of them. I think I said it on our group. Yes, I forgive them. They shot him. They said, denounce Christ. He said, he will not denounce. Let's look at uh, that Matthew chapter. You have verse 32. Read. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will also I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus is saying that if you stand, they say, I will shoot. It's to test if somebody just enter with, with a gun here. Do you still believe that Jesus? You see something, you say, no, 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 I run out of this church. No, 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 I don't believe that Jesus again. If you do like that, Jesus said he will also disown you when you come to heaven. It's a serious thing to renounce Christ. It's a big, big thing to say, no, I don't know Jesus. If you do like that, you have already turned your back on him. Hallelujah. Amen. Then Jesus said, you have not denied my name. The church of Philadelphia did not deny the name of Jesus. And the second way that you can deny the name of Jesus is to do things that are contrary to, the, to what Jesus wants. If you lie and cheat and do immorality and live your life that way, you have denied the name of Jesus. You have denied his name. Because your lifestyle doesn't qualify with his own, with what his word says. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are living a lifestyle that is no good, you are also denying Jesus. So this church of Philadelphia, the brethren lived a life that you can see them and say these are ambassadors for Christ. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul is saying, you are ambassadors for Christ. As if God was making his appeal through you. You are you are presenting Christ on earth. With the most look at us and say, these are real Christians. I'm not just talking about moral life. I'm talking about the lifestyle that stands firm. One brother was testifying here the other week that they came and said that you steal electricity. Some of us do those things. You steal electricity. You collect, you go and cheat. You change the metal. And then you are having uh, hot water. You are having this thing. You are not paying anything. Eh? You are not... You, 
the, the, the small, small things that the government says we should do. The Bible says we should obey the state authority if we owe them taxes we should pay. If you are not reading your Bible, those are things I say. You steal the electricity, you steal whatever thing, whatever water, you steal whatever thing. Eh? Your lifestyle is not standing. You are not an ambassador. So that brother was testifying that they said they should steal. They were living in a big house. They said they should agree and steal electricity because of something that happened. He said, I will not steal. They steal the electricity, but when they steal it, it will still affect, uh, you will still use it by force because they are connecting for everybody. And he was feeling very grief. Then, when the people saw that he was not stealing, they went and disconnected his back. Then, the landlord came up suddenly, without informing them. They came and was glad and was thanking him. And said the landlord would have caught off. It would have been a different thing. <laughs> Hallelujah! Yeah. He was shining the light. He was an ambassador. They saw the light. These things, some of them are very difficult, but we are children of God. Hallelujah! We have to stand. We live in a world where even the, the, the authorities, some authorities will encourage you to sin. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you have to live like an ambassador for Christ. You have to live like that. If you, if you say that you are a child of God, then you will not deny the name of Christ through your actions. Hey, sometimes say, I'm not talking to that person. I think I cannot hear it from any person in this church. That you are not talking to somebody. That you are holding somebody, not forgiving. You are not an ambassador. Jesus forgave us our sin. And each time we keep saying forgive our sin. How dare you not forgive? Even your mother is a what? Even your father is a what? Forgive. Hallelujah. Amen. I said this man who was shot. They shot him. They bullet scattered. Even when they show the wound, you don't like to stand it. Because they put it on me. Hey. The man said, I forgive them. I love them from my heart. If a, such a person can forgive, then even somebody who just hurt you a small thing, forgive. Hallelujah. Jesus will do something for the church of Philadelphia. Look at verse 9, that one. Jesus will do something. In that, in, 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 look at that Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, that one. It says that, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my commandment to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Jesus said he will make those who persecute you. They will come and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have sent you. Is it saying that they will come and worship us? No. No. He said that they acknowledge that the gospel we are preaching is true. Amen. Even though they persecuted you. Even though your friends mock at you in school. Even though they laugh at you. Even though your family member rejected you. Even though they say you are crazy. With time, God will open their own eyes. And they will see that you will speaking the truth. And they will fall down and worship that your God told you. Hallelujah. Amen. So you have to stand firm. And Jesus said something in verse 10. And say, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Many scholars, Bible scholars, they are saying that this thing that they are saying like this, many people are hearing, we have just passed coronavirus now. We are, we are going to our business. We don't, many people don't have time with God again. You know, during corona, even nations were repenting. If you see or saw on the TV, nation were kneeling and say, God help us. After Corona, they don't know God again. After Corona, individuals don't know God. They are doing their businesses and going. But do you know that another one can hit? We are living in the end time. Another thing can boom again. Only those who know their God will stand. So scholars are saying that this hour of trial may be the tribulation that the church has to go before Christ comes. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what they are saying. I know there are many schools of thought, but many people are saying like that. It may be this... If you know, he's saying that it is these people who are standing. It is these people who are poor in spirit. Those who are standing firm and doing the evangelism work. They are the people that will stand that time because God will give them grace. Amen. Amen. The, the trial is coming to test those who live on the earth. Many unbelievers. And they say in that place that that, that place is repeated in the, in the book of Revelation about nine times. 
The test is for unbelievers and not for believers. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, let me just read 2 Peter chapter 2. We see to, just to confirm that fact. That God is saying that because many believers are also afraid. When they say what will happen again, will I know that thing? You don't need to fear when you have Christ. Hallelujah. You don't need to fear when you are standing firm. When you are examining your life, you don't need to fear. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, if this is so, it was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, how God punished them, and uh, even talking about angels that fell from the grace, God punished them. We'll not read behind. Then a poor, uh, the Peter went there to say that, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. Hallelujah. The Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. Hallelujah. Amen. The hour of trial may come. Do you know one of the things people fear? 666, six, six, even unbelievers fear. <laughs> but do you know who will stand not to take 666? Six, six unbelievers will take it away. They cannot stand hunger for two weeks, two months. They will take it quickly. It's only somebody who knows hell and heaven. That will say, no, I will not take it. And God knows how he will sustain us. If he allow us to pass through that time, he knows how he will sustain you. Hallelujah. And if you don't even know your love from your right, before they want to make you take, you take, you don't even know. You cannot stand. If you cannot even stand to live a life that portrays Christ, will you stand when they say, don't buy, don't sell? Will you stand? And you know that when you take, that's what? Straight. You cannot reverse it. You can even say now, I fell in sin yesterday and I've confessed today, God forgive. That one is for an eternal, it's a mark. An eternal condemnation mark. And God says that that hour of trial, he will sustain the, Philippi, the, the church of Philadelphia. That means he's talking to us. Those who are living right, God will sustain you. Amen. Hallelujah. God will keep you. God will protect you Amen. during that time. Hallelujah. Amen. So God wants a Christian of Philadelphia and us to do something. In verse 11, he says that, that uh, verse 11 of that Revelation 3, God is talking to the church. He said, I am coming soon. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, I am coming soon. When the, when the Bible says I'm coming soon, you know many people say six how many years. Do you know what coming soon means? It means I will come suddenly. I will come in a way that you didn't expect. That's what God is saying. God will surprise us. Like Some people will be doing their thing, but you will not know because nobody knows the day or the hour. If we is that we knew the day and the hour, this God is so wise. Hey, would you prepare that day? All of us be holy. <laughs> it would have been so nice, but that's not how God is. God will surprise us. So we should live like people, like strangers in this world, like people who are waiting for the king, that like people who are expecting to go. This is not our home. That's why things are strange to believers. We are preparing for our home. So I'm coming soon. I'll come suddenly. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. You know what God is promising here? Hold on to the little faith, to the, to, to the little strength you have. That means continue to test and hunger after God. Continue to pray. Continue to study the word. Continue to preach. Continue to fellowship. That's what he's saying. Continue. Hold on to what you have. Obey the word. He said that you obey what you are hearing. Continue in it. Be because I'm coming so. soon. I will, over, I will surprise people. And if you overcome, I will make you a pillar. Hallelujah. Amen. I will make you a pillar. I will make you, I will give you divine stability. I will make you to be stable in my house. And no one is able to take your crown. The devil cannot steal your crown. You know the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. In John 10, 10 Jesus came to give life. The thing that the devil wants to do to believers is to steal your faith. He wants you to go to hell with him. He is jealous of your position. And will you let go that position to him? You will not let go. So don't allow the devil to come and trick you and take your crown. Hallelujah. So he encouraged the, 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 the saint to stand firm. And the person who can also steal your crown is you yourself. 
The Bible says that God your heart with all diligence. For out of it come the issue of life. So Jesus is exalted. Say, I will give you, uh, you will never leave, you will be permanent in my house. Never will you will leave my house. Read that place, you'll see. You will be permanent. I will write the name of my God. Ah, I will decorate you. I will give you, uh, uh, when, when they give these things, uh, sometimes for, for the army, they will give you ranks. God will give you a rank in heaven. And God will write the name of the uh, of his God, Jesus said, "I'll write the name of my God on you. Maybe holy unto God. He will give you that star, that rank, and he will write the name of the new city. He will also write his name. What a decoration! You belong now to another city. You belong now to heaven. That's what God will write on you and mark you. He will write the name of God. This one is holy unto the Lord. This is that this brother is holy unto the Lord. He will also write his name on you, belonging to Jesus. That's what he is promising." And when you have those decorations like that, you move like a general, a spiritual general. Hallelujah. Amen. These are the marks of intimacy and identification. Hallelujah. Amen. To show that we are privileged to enter. Amen. And he say, he who has an ear, hear. So what, has they, what, what are we saying about the church of Philadelphia? What distinguished them? They didn't have any blame among these seven churches. Only Philadelphia and Simeonia didn't have blame. But for Simeonia, God stay, stand firm even to the point of death. For this one, they were only standing firm. But he says that, hold on to what you have, because if you think that you are standing firm, maybe you can let go. If you let go, if you don't hold on to what you already have, you can let go and the death can steal your crown. So continue to hold it. And when you, what, what makes them different? They were, they were set as an, an evangelism uh, uh, church. They were evangelizing. The door was open and they were evangelizing. They, 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 they were hunger and thirsty after God. They are of little strength. They have been faithful to Jesus. They have kept his word and his name. Their lifestyle proved that they are believers. They are born again. The things they say and do in the community, people can point, hey, you look at that one. You know that these people around us, they know. I've gone for evangelism. You don't even know a believer. Oh, you know, you say, you see that man? Huh? And the person testifies, he's not even a believer. That one is the only believer in this quarter. Eh? He's the only one who go to their church, that is true. They are telling us. They know. They are pointing this one. I don't know whether they can point at you like that. That's the only one that I see that is going to that church, that is true. They say like that. They can classify you. So this church was faithful, they kept the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So Jesus was pleased with them. They didn't say that this church were doing a lot of activity or the many miracles. I like the miracles. I like them. They didn't even say this church was 2,000 members. They didn't say like that. But what Jesus is looking for is the fact that you, you are hunger and thirst after him. You are passionate for him. What he's looking for is that you preach the gospel. What he's looking for is that you keep his name. You live a lifetime that can point at you and say, this is an ambassador. Uh, as if Christ was making his appeal through you to all believers to see you and say, eh, eh, that one is a different one in the community. That's all what makes Philadelphia different. Are they great things? They are just simple things. But are they simple that, that simple? It's not easy to live a life that will point at you. Let's stand up. It's not easy. Hallelujah. Amen. But Jesus has nothing against this church. Nothing against this church, brethren. It was not saying that they have jet planes. You know, today they measure uh, uh, breakthrough in ministry by jet planes. Breakthrough in ministry by how many people have cars in that church. Breakthrough in ministry by how many, um, what is the number? Even if I can go to Sangoma and, uh, and pull the crowd, uh, uh, I have thousand members. Jesus did not talk like that to the church of Philadelphia. The thousand members are like it, but that's not what qualifies. What qualifies is there and then these three things that we have said. They did not deny the name of Jesus either by their action or verbally. They went through persecution. They did not deny the name of Jesus. They, they, they showed that they were hunger and thirst. They were preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to begin to pray and say, I want to be like the brethren in the church of Philadelphia. Jesus 